boy, where do I even start with this one? There are countless moments that come to my mind if we're talking the worst things to have ever happened in Hell's Kitchen. But if you're asking me to count down the top 20 worst, well, let me introduce you to the most recent season's main villain. Oh boy, hated chefs, huh? Now, you're likely thinking about Frank Kala, Jason Underwood, Tavon Hubbard, or how about Tiffany Gross or Elise Harris? But these aren't the only ones who have earned the ire of the fan base. Far from it. Like, I know I have a ton more bones to pick myself. Well, like this guy who made his mark as a villain in the latest season of the show. Looking at me, and not for good reasons. I've had to fight all my life. Allow me to introduce you to Jason Hedden. So in the signature dish challenge, Jason showcased a citrus and chili infused main lobster with charred lemon. You haven't got brine because it's very, very sweet. Sounds great, right? But Ramsey found the dish overly sweet. He pointed out that the addition of honey seemed unnecessary, considering lobsters naturally possess a subtle sweetness of their own, which is why Ramsey awarded him with a modest three points. Three points too many if you ask me. However, Jason didn't want to take the note. The flavor profile is on point and visually stunning. Yeah, this dude actually had the audacity to question Ramsey's judgment in the very first episode. That dish is a four or five easy. Not to mention the fact that he absolutely creeped everyone out. Like, can someone please explain the context behind this joke? Everything we get here, we take home. Jackets, knives. STDs. And then he began his sexist tirade against the women. I don't think any of them have a all of talent. But Devin and my man Demir immediately put him down for it. But this is just confidential of us just like talking. Oh yeah, Jason was definitely heading down a pretty disgusting path. But the other guys weren't here for it. I think Jason thinks he's being funny. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, these two could have easily joined in and ignored the women's skills too, but I gotta hand it to them. They didn't. Major props to Demir especially. He strikes me as a dude with a heart of gold. My goal is to stay composed, stay focused, and do what I came here to do. And that's why I love the guy. But back to Jason. It's not just the attitude. He didn't display any decent skills or teamwork either. In his first service, he was on the fish station alongside Devin. At one point, sous chef Jason caught him trying to cook a lobster tail off the heat. Yeah, I don't get it either. Anyway, when questioned, Jason defended his approach, explaining that he aimed to prevent it from separating. What, it just sits there and we hope it cooks? I don't want to separate. However, Ramsey spotted a, you guessed it, raw lobster tail amongst the other appetizers. Who could have seen that coming? I know it's first night nerves, but come on. Yes, that sure. means at least another three or four minutes. Come on. Anyway, Jason's second attempt at the lobster tail came out practically identical to the first. What do you think? It looks raw. Yeah. Yeah, it looks a little higher. Him not responding to his team made for a hell of an awkward silence. Jason's just staring into complete space. He has his pedigree and he's worked for all these chefs, but you know, it's just not acceptable, right? As the raw lobster tail made its ill-fated second appearance, Ramsey wasted no time in whisking Jason and Devin away for a backstage chat. But Devin was just collateral damage. Pull into the back to give them hugs and attaboys. He pulls you into the back to pull your head out of your ass. <laughs> exactly. Despite Ramsey's best effort, the raw lobster tails kept coming. Like Ramsey was practically shouting into the void here. Yeah. Come on, guys, get up. We need you. two more for you right, right now, now, Chef. And yeah, the entrees weren't much better. Where a raw halibut destined for Oscar De La Hoya further tarnished Jason's performance. And then, of course, it contributed to the blue team getting their kitchen shuttered. Pathetic opening in all my life. Get the. Out of here. And despite his horrible performance, he denied responsibility during deliberation. Oh, he was arrogant too. I do not think I put up undercooked fish. Yeah, the dude had no integrity at all. Now, during the third service, Ramsey caught him smearing cold butter on a steak that was eventually supposed to land on Nikki Howard's table. Dude gets to cook for the greats and keeps dropping the bag. I just basted it, I was flashing it before we you go. You just up. basted it. Yes, chef. And then, in a desperate attempt to justify his actions, Jason claimed he was basting the steak. Didn't look like any kind of basting I've ever seen. However, Ramsey called upon Ryan to examine the situation, 
only to confirm that Jason's claim was indeed far from the truth. When you're running your own empire, then you call the shots. Yes, if sir. I catch you just smearing cold butter on steak. Oh, you gotta wait for the real burn, though. You do it my way, or it's the highway. Is that clear? 100%. Classic, right? Despite getting caught red-handed, he continued defending himself. And for somebody to have had all of your backs since day one, I would expect that in return. Oh, man. Trust me. That was embarrassing to watch. And while scrolling through tons of discussions online, I found this viewer's take here absolutely on point. You see, by episode two, Jason had proven to be narcissistic, ignorant, stupid, and sexist, all rolled into one slimy man. And he reminded me of someone from season four who coincidentally shared his name. And of course, Cheyenne from season 21 also shared that sentiment. And I'm not about, so why smirk off your face. Yes, chef. Raw lamb. For those of you who are yet to catch up on season 22, let me put it this way. Jason's reached the star-studded status of stayed way too long. But guess who else overstayed their welcome on the show? Uh, wait, let me allow Declan to describe him. Because there's no way I could do what he said justice myself. I think he suffers from Napoleon complex. Yeah, the way he boasted about being the heart and soul of the team earlier on, and then flipped to a completely delusional state in his final episodes, really rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, come on, calling himself better than Declan and Amber in his elimination episode? That's just not acceptable or even remotely correct. So, have you guessed who I'm talking about? Well, it's none other than Mark from season 19. Now, when Cody offered to help by taking over the risotto, Mark struggled to find the capers. Dinner service is starting up and Mark's already in a haze. And sometime later, there was a moment of confusion regarding the flat top, which was off, causing tension and accusations to fly between Mark and Cody. The fucking stove is off. Yeah, chef, just one of them. It was off. Basically, Mark blamed Cody, who was only trying to help him. This led to a breakdown in communication, with Mark shutting down Cody's attempts to contribute to the risotto. He's starting to try to help you. The risotto's done, I got it. It's Unfortunately, but expectedly, the end result was underwhelming. Mark presented Ramsey with a bland risotto and curdled carbonara to boot. Yummy, right? Well, Ramsey put these disappointing dishes on blast for the whole team to see. That's curdled overcooked. There's no fucking seasoning Mark, in there. If I tell you it's not ready, it's not ready, okay? Later on, Ramsey requested a refire. Although he sent it back up, Ramsey's reaction was far from pleasant. Hey, just taste that. Taste that. Yeah, oh, now, all of you. Yes, sir. Right. What's more, the whole blue team had to suffer through tasting it. Ramsey then took Mark aside, pulling him into the pantry and gave him a stern reminder. Despite Mark's ambition to handle the appetizers, Ramsey pointed out that nothing had been coming out as expected or even remotely up to snuff. Nothing's come out on point. I'm warning you, get a grip yes, now. Yes, and don't even get me started on how Adam got completely robbed. He was actually good with just one bad night. Unlike Mark, who was consistently bad, and was only especially so on that particular night. Anyway, during prep, Mark chatted up Adam about the procedure for the fish that night, which raised eyebrows among the team. Good chance, what's this for tonight? To approach the lobster, Taylor. Okay. Amber in particular felt Mark's questions proved he had absolutely no clue about the blue team's way of doing things. Mark is a little bit not on point. And she was right. During the dinner service, Mark found himself manning the fish station with Declan, labeling his performance as, well, I'll let him say it. The weakest member of the group still is Mark. So this is when Adam stepped in to handle the lobster tail. Let's see if he can do it better than Jason did. I got the lobster. Oh, we told each other, Mark. Yes, and then came the moment when Ramsey wasn't pleased with Mark's bland scampi, promptly sending it back. When asked for a refire, Mark went silent, causing more than a bit of frustration. Where's the scampi? Oh my God. Later on, Mark found himself grappling with what felt like a completely different fish station due to having to cook items other than fish. I'm cooking fried eggs. Never as easy as you think. I'm cooking this mammoth veal chop. Really? Fried eggs, Mark? That's what we're worried about here? So anyway, he had Adam lend a hand with his fried egg. Yeah. 
Hey, f yourself. Later, he misinterpreted an order, confusing how much New York strip and salmon he needed. First the fried eggs, and now counting? This guy, you guys. Mark, what the f is going on? Ramsey immediately gathered the blue team into the back pantry for a stern dressing down eventually cutting out the middleman and sending them packing back to the dorms. Oliver, come here. Oh my god. And then, in the deliberation, both Declan and Amber pointed fingers at Mark for the night's awful results. Mark, in his defense, argued that he was trying his best to communicate effectively for the team. However, Amber wasn't super on board with that notion. Mark wasn't communicating enough. Oh god, I love this show. Anyway, Mark actually perceived the team's nomination as a personal attack. He confronted Adam about a burned egg, but Adam countered, understandably frustrated at being burdened with extra tasks when he had his own responsibilities to take care of. The only problem that I had tonight was how much I had to help out Mark. Yeah, poor Adam. He definitely deserved to stay. Eventually, Mark found himself named as the blue team's primary nominee for elimination, with Adam as the second. During his plea to Ramsey, Mark claimed that he was the adaptable one among them, and pinned the blame on receiving bad timings for the fish. Ramsey then questioned him about the weakest stations that night, to which Mark threw garnish and meat under the bus before he started randomly praising himself. With my team working against me. It's never his fault, is it? Chef, I'm the most passionate, versatile, most creative chef in this competition. To quote this viewer, he was not just the clown, but the entire circus. Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. But here comes a contestant who could rival Mark in narcissism. I know it sounds ludicrous, but trust me. And despite his elimination, Anton, in his exit interview, boldly declared himself the real winner that night. Was the best out of everybody in there. So that makes me the winner of health. Somebody needs to shame the self-aggrandizing attitude out of him, like stats. Now, Anton was a decent enough cook, but his problem was that he had a big ego. The clash with Chef Andy really put that front and center. And let's face it, in any workplace, disrespecting someone higher up the chain of command would never fly. Yelling for next door, it's 18 minutes, you have five minutes on the side. I let it rest Stop for five yelling minutes. at me. When handling the meat station, he lost his cool, prompting Scott to step in and offer help by slicing the chicken for him. Chicken's right here, I gotta cut it. I'll slice it right now, I'll slice it right Water, now. Give please, it to me. Please, please. And when the pinkest chicken in the world was revealed, guess whose fault it was? It really seems it needs like another 30 seconds. This is my time up. Dude, he was trying to help you. But the chaos continued as the red team's diners started to get restless. Kashia managed to send up her salmon, but Anton delayed the Wellingtons, claiming they needed an extra, oh, how long was it? 10 minutes. Yes, chef. And Ramsey heard this horrible excuse for communication from across the freaking room, and he knew he had to put a stop to it. She's running over the salmon. He's 10 minutes away. However, things took yet another turn for the worse when Scott sliced into his Wellingtons, only to find them all overcooked. That's, those are all oh. over. Hello? Those are my two newest, I gotta replace them. Ramsey reprimanded Anton for the mess, but Anton attempted to deflect the blame, citing differences in ovens between the blue and red kitchens. Next door's oven, I got it down pat, this one I screwed it up. Oh. These excuses didn't cut it. Like, the dude was practically blaming the controller for losing at a video game here. Talk about petty and immature. 14 minutes. This oven you said is 14 minutes on the Wellington? When sous chef Andy attempted to clear things up for him, he outright refused to heed her guidance, citing her gender as a valid reason not to take her seriously. Some little girl, get in my face. Start ripping a new ass. Yeah, at this point, I may as well retitle the video as most sexist chefs or something. Jeez. <coughs> Anyway, as Andy's frustration grew about Anton's defiance, he brazenly declared that her attempts to get through to him wouldn't break him. And I'm just going to piss you off. He felt emasculated for sure. Moreover, he deliberately aggravated her by asserting that he had everything under control, too. Don't you f***ing talk back to me! Don't you ever talk back to me! Yes, you are! And all of this BS eventually led to Andy exploding in frustration with Joy and Kasia calling out Anton for crossing a line. 
I mean, he was like 10 miles over it, but they're not wrong, I guess. Anyway, Ramsey intervened by pulling Anton into the back pantry. Ramsey drilled into him the fact that he needed to shape up and he needed to do it now. Your head's in the sand, and at this moment now, I need you to rise. And when the red team eventually lost, shocker, I know, Ramsey didn't hold back in highlighting Anton's responsibility for it. Tom, you suck your team. Yet again, though, Anton tried shifting the blame to the oven. Again. That oven there is the exact same as that oven. I'm just saying, I should have went in there and. Still bandying out that tired old excuse, huh? And yeah, Ramsey wasn't gonna stand there and let this guy spew a bunch of BS at him. No way, no how. It's just part of who I am. Do I deserve to be up there? Not at all. Of course he booked a seat for himself on the Elimination Express. When given the chance to plead his case, Anton expressed confidence in his abilities, suggesting that Ramsey should recognize them too. However, Ramsey felt like Anton had peaked a while back and didn't have any more room to grow. When questioned about his terrible communication at critical points in the service, Anton said, But you feel that's an issue. If that's something I've done, then I have to work on it. God. Thankfully, he wasn't lucky enough to dodge the bullet here. Ramsey sent him packing for all the reasons you'd expect. In his exit interview, Anton maintained his confidence, claiming to know his strengths and aspiring to open a restaurant near one of Ramsey's. He even believed himself to be the best among the remaining eight contestants, despite his elimination. Maybe next time it'll be his restaurant next door to mine. And that's why you're walking out the door there, buddy. <laughs> Next, let's talk about... That you have a heart on for Virginia. Yeah, her. It's a common consensus that Virginia only landed a black jacket in season two because the talent pool was pretty damn weak. When you look at Heather and Keith, they stood out the most, and Heather clearly outshone Keith. But man, she was getting some serious favoritism from Ramsey. At least, plenty of people think so. But there's an equally valid argument in the other direction, too. Virginia's journey to the final was fueled by her resilience and the courage to own up to her mistakes. Her unwavering, yes, chef, might just go down as the strongest in Hell's Kitchen history. And another thing that stood out was her lack of drama with the other cast members. Virginia handled herself remarkably well at the past, too. She had a ton of potential, and we all know how much Ramsey appreciates a good underdog story. What do you think? Personally, I'd love for Virginia to come back in an All-Stars 2 or something so that we can put this debate to rest. She'd be my dark horse pick to win it all. But now, let's talk about this chef who strutted in with all the confidence in the world, but honestly, couldn't really back it up. Hardly narrows it down, I know. Here's another hint. He also kept on boasting about being the best chef, which felt more like wishful thinking than reality. Kind of self-described as being a badass in the kitchen. He was bad. And an ass. First off, he pulled this dirty move with Mikey. It's not done yet. Hey, f us. We need it now, we need it now, we need it now, let's go. Yeah, he got him to bring up a raw halibut in the very first service. Roll! 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 Then, in the second challenge, he messed up Salvatore's eggs. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, heard it as soon as I said it, but you know what I mean, right? Scott comes out from behind and says, no, put it in, cook him some more. Either way, he almost caused the blue team to crash and burn because he sabotaged everyone. So grainy. Scott told me he was kind of running. Exactly. And remember that time he served a raw burger and totally messed up the potatoes during dinner service? I've got a raw burger, yes, yes. Put your finger in there. That's the chef. Scott. Not only that, but they're all Broken to f yeah. yeah. That was a classic Scott. He was also constantly trying to steal the limelight, taking credit for others' work. A, a pretty good working relationship together. He's my pet project. Yeah, YouTube's on a huge plagiarism kick right now, so figured I'd contribute a little too. He also started poking his nose into everyone else's station during service, trying to help. And half the time, his own station would practically be burning down. And he wrapped it all up by serving a bunch of raw food during the fourth service. And tonight, you know, obviously I was a little bit off. I understand the chef expects perfection. At that point, disaster seemed to follow him like a bad smell everywhere he went in the kitchen. 
And nothing changed when he joined the red team. He had a knack for wrecking whatever they were working on, almost as if he was on a mission to sabotage their efforts. In one challenge, he single-handedly ruined the red team's shot at victory. He convinced Nilka to serve up some blood sausage with prunes. Chose prune with blood sausage. Then to top it off, he whipped up a sweet potato soup with Maria, garnishing it with ham hock when the main ingredient was supposed to be the ham hock itself. And you're serving me a sweet potato garnish with a spoon of ham hock? At this point, I started wondering if he was secretly planted there to test the chef's patience. But oh, it didn't stop there. He managed to serve fried chicken that looks like it had been fried for ages, and to add to the mess, he left an oven door open. He really could have gotten someone hurt. Can that and bang. One arm in the fryer, one on the stove. Real catastrophe hit during his worst service yet. Scott completely lost it, forgetting orders left and right. I don't know, is the spaghetti coming what out? What do you mean the I don't know? What do you mean? Why are you discussing together? And his team for the chaos, but truth be told, his own performance was a disaster. Raw Wellingtons, burnt chicken and beef. And to top it off, he forgot to put the gratin on the beef dish. The kicker? He admitted he knew the Wellingtons were undercooked, but thought they were good enough. On order six covered table 41, was salmon or beef, two spaghetti, two fish fingers. Yeah, because Ramsay always accepts good enough. Even after all the disasters he caused, Scott had the audacity to proclaim himself the best chef on both teams. But finally, Ramsay had enough and shut him down with the elimination. The best leader in this team, I can accomplish I can't team. take it anymore. Pretty rare to see someone whose confidence surpass their talent by such a huge margin. It makes it hard. But at the end of the day, I'm still gonna go on and continue to- But that didn't make it any less fun to watch. The last thing you should do in an environment as charged as Hell's Kitchen is get angry. But these contestants, didn't seem to get the memo. I didn't set it up, Chef. So Who I set it up. And they set it up. She can't cook asparagus. She snores and it keeps us all awake. These are the contestants who straight up betrayed their teammates. And how about starting things off with this contestant from the All Stars season? So it was the Italian night dinner service. Michelle was assigned to the meat station while Manda was in charge of preparing the pasta dishes. For those of you who didn't know, Manda has celiac disease, so she couldn't taste the pasta herself. And so she went for the next best thing and asked Michelle for her opinion instead. Michelle tasted Manda's pasta and nodded in approval, saying it was good. Taste that for me. Is that done? Mm. 30 more seconds, okay. So far, so normal. Right? However, unknown to Manda, Michelle had ulterior motives. Ramsey tasted it, and well, what do you know? The first batch of pasta returned to the kitchen undercooked. It looks like a lot, Chef. It's a no, just is taste raw. it. Just the taste it. Is raw. It's crunchy as. Manda was puzzled because she trusted Michelle's judgment. Michelle, on the other hand... I can tell when pasta's done just by looking at it, so Manda should be able to do it too. So were you blind while checking Manda's dish? Or, uh, what do you call not being able to taste? Anyway, Manda made a second attempt in hopes of getting it right this time. But as if she learned absolutely nothing, she sought Michelle's opinion again. Michelle, in turn, claimed the pasta was fine. Again. I need a mouth. Here, Michelle. It's done. Michelle says the is done. But thanks to Elise, it was revealed that the pasta was still raw. And you wouldn't believe how nonchalant Michelle was about the whole thing. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. My bad. The first time I could excuse as an honest mistake. But twice? Nah, I don't think so. And she was so unapologetic about it. Michelle was fooling no one. Viewers saw right through it, and Manda also realized that she was being misled. Good job. <laughs> Me twice now. Well, at least she didn't go in for a third round of punishment. But this next contestant exposed herself for the conniving, self-absorbed prick that she was during her run on the show. Witnessing Heather's struggle on the appetizer station in the third service brought a wicked gleam to Sarah's eye. Some kind of perverse, sadistic pleasure. She didn't just observe, she took pleasure in Heather's challenges, making a snide comment about the risotto too. I couldn't have graduated culinary school without making risotto. 
not my first rodeo. <laughs> in the fourth service, she was even more conniving. Tasked with the fish station, she forewent all pretenses of teamwork. Uh, Sarah, are we ready, yes? Yeah, I was waiting for her call, Steph. Called it three times. Her lack of communication with Rachel, despite repeated calls, disrupted the whole kitchen's flow. Yet, the extent of her deceit went beyond that. When Virginia asked if she was set with her turbot, Sarah brazenly lied, claiming she was. How close are you to the turbot and the tortellini? Paula, I'm ready and waiting for your call. Can we start bringing these plates up? Trusting her word, Virginia sent her Wellingtons to the pass, only to discover Sarah hadn't even begun cooking the turbot yet. And Ramsey wasn't pleased with either of them. Where's the turbot? Chef, I haven't fired it yet. In the aftermath, Sarah's reaction was chillingly remorseless. She seems pretty pleased that her underhanded plan went, well, according to plan. She did start cooking it, Chef. So now you want to start lying to me. I'm not lying to you, Chef. She laughed silently as Virginia faced Ramsey's wrath for what he saw as sabotage. Sarah didn't speak up and say, Chef, I did tell her that I was ready. She should have at least spoken up and said something. Damn right she should have. In a word, it just really sucked to see Sarah put Virginia through that. Did I misunderstand you when I heard you say you were ready whenever I am? Uh, it was tortellini. I didn't but here comes one of the most unworthy winners of HK, Ariel Malone of season 15. And her betrayal during the second service was deviously underhanded. Two snapper, three chicken, I'm dying. That's gonna be five to the window, Chef. What's wrong with the snapper? While Mia stepped away for a moment, Ariel pounced on the opportunity, snatching her snapper and serving it up raw. We never said it was ready. Ariel come and grabbed it and took it up there. Oh my god, seriously. Ramsey's always watching, even in the dorms. And what better way to express that than having Ramsey at his worst on the wall? A little reminder that Gordon's always watching. Yep, in the midst of all the luxury, you better not forget who the real boss is. Where's the lamb sauce? Well, Ramsey might be the boss, no doubt. You look like a female version of f***ing Hannibal Lecter. Put your f***ing tongue in and concentrate. Quite the description, huh? And that tongue lashing you just heard was directed towards Sharon from season four. So what happened is, during the signature dish challenge, Sharon presented something that ultimately didn't meet the high standards of the competition. And Ramsey didn't hold back in letting her know. You know damn well that isn't up to scratch. For Hell's Kitchen. Her first service in the kitchen only added to her troubles. Ramsey called her out for an unseasoned risotto, something it's always the seasoning, and when asked to taste her own dish, she couldn't see the issue. Oh, come on, Sharon. It's like rice pudding. Instead of taking responsibility, Sharon attempted to shift some of the blame onto her teammates. That's not just my fault, and it's too bad that Chef Ramsay didn't see that. Later, in a bid to redeem herself, she ended up preparing more risotto than needed, which only confused matters and discouraged Ramsay further. Which one are you cooking? This one. Whose is this one? I don't know, I'll get rid of it. Oh, come on, Sharon. The final blow came when her refire, intended to be an improvement, was rejected because of an overwhelming <laughs> amount of garlic. Sharon, enough's enough. F off, I'm going to put some more makeup on. I mean, I always add more garlic than it says to on the recipe, but there are limits. Yeah, she was removed from her station right then and there. However, during prep before the second service, her confusion over the recipes led Corey to step in and guide her through the tasks, which didn't sit well with the team. Our team has a problem right now, just worth sharing. It puts us at a really big disadvantage. And things didn't improve during dinner service when Sharon was assigned to the meat station. Ramsey quickly noticed that she had placed cooked meat near raw meat, something that we know all too well from Kitchen Nightmares that is never a good idea. And as the service continued, Sharon's struggles persisted. She forgot to send out a beef dish, causing further delay and frustration. When Ramsey tried to see if she was communicating with Christina, her response was 
Well, it wasn't a response, actually. It was more like nonsensical blabbering. No, I did it. I did it early. I thought it was coming. She just yelled it was coming. Assuming Christina would be ready, she didn't bother communicating, leading Ramsey to bestow upon her a title for the ages. You're not really a chef, are you? You're just a showgirl with a big feather coming out your ass. Man, you think you've heard it all. But the breaking point came when a halibut dish prepared by Jason was sent back and Ramsey accused Sharon of slowing down the entire operation. In response to the mounting issues, Ramsey made the difficult decision to shut down the restaurant. By this point, Sharon's inexperience and inability to handle the pressure of Hell's Kitchen had become glaringly evident, ultimately leading to her downfall in the competition. Surprisingly, she wasn't nominated for elimination by Corey. However, Ramsey decided to make a tough call. Two services. You haven't convinced me that you can cook. He chose to eliminate Sharon outright, citing her consecutive poor performances. But Sharon wasn't convinced. I don't think Gordon likes me from the start. He just had the wrong image of me. Well, she didn't have the skill, but she sure had the confidence. I'm gonna hold off on that. We need the salmon and the tagline telly first before anything else. Dude, I can't wait! Ignoring even more advice from Gail, she was hell-bent on sending out her Wellingtons early. I just spent like 20 minutes cooking all this, letting it rest, doing it right, you know? As if that was gonna go well. Why are you throwing them under the bus? I'm not, Chef. What can I do with it? Nothing, Chef. Oh. I think she totally deserved being up for elimination that night. You are, quite frankly, the most selfish cook in here. Ramsey's justified criticism didn't phase Sabrina. Instead, she stubbornly defended herself during the plea, indirectly pointing the finger at Lisa's age. She's spent, Chef. You know, I'm young. The world is my what oyster. Just spent. Me. Spent? Uh huh. That's definitely the problem here. Instead of reflecting on her own actions, she took yet another low blow at Nona, attempting to discredit her with even more petty and irrelevant excuses. Her idea of fine dining is fried chicken, chef. She can't cook asparagus. She snores and it keeps us all awake. Like, hold on for a minute. Is she for real? Sabrina's attempt to manipulate the elimination by bringing personal issues to the forefront not only showcased her lack of professionalism, but also highlighted her willingness to betray a teammate by playing dirty in a competition that should have been about culinary skill, not personal vendettas. During the Italian night service, Sabrina's behavior towards Gail was yet another serious letdown. She was in charge of the grill, but struggled big time with timing, leaving Ramsey and her entire team in the dark. Um, chef, my pork. Just give me a fucking time! Okay, four minutes on Thank my pork, you. chef! Talk to your team then! Yes, chef. Gail attempted to coordinate with Sabrina in spite of it all, but the inconsistent timing threw her off. How long on the second pork, Sabrina? Probably about seven, eight minutes. No, I don't trust Sabrina at all. She doesn't know her timing. Then, in a move that reeked of betrayal, she knowingly sent her dish out. Even though Gail wasn't ready with her pasta, she told her to wait. We're waiting for the pasta now. It just makes Gail look bad. <laughs> and yeah, everybody heard that. Yeah, it was a deliberate move to make Gail look bad. Plain and simple. Everybody thinks that I'm stupid, but you know what? I'm one manipulative girl. Sabrina's actions were downright underhanded. Her confession painted her as someone who prioritized herself over the team as a collective. And honestly, who would want to work with someone like that? Instead of focusing on her own strengths during the elimination plea, she chose the path of least integrity. She was more concerned about pointing out others' weaknesses and throwing even more lame excuses out left and right. When it was her turn to speak up, Sabrina attempted to justify her spot by exaggerating her supposedly good performances, all the while conveniently using her inexperience as a safety net. Who would you rather have work for you? Somebody who has a title of an executive chef or somebody who hasn't been doing it this long? But Ramsey wasn't having any of it. He called her out, absolutely destroying her for using using her inexperience as an excuse. Don't use that inexperience excuse on me ever again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that was never gonna work. And by the way, this was something he made abundantly clear in previous seasons. I don't give two f**ks about how much experience you've got. What I do care about is who has the magic, who has it. Sabrina's pleas throughout the entire season were a disaster. 
Her over-the-top drama and all-too-common deflection absolutely stunk of immaturity and a lack of accountability. Instead of, you know, showing genuine passion or a willingness to learn from mistakes, she relied on empty excuses and pointed fingers. A hell of an unfortunate duo, if I've ever seen one. Now, let's talk about the time when Zacky pulled the wackiest move on Ray in season 11. You see, right from the prep phase before the 11th service, when Ray offered his help, Zack blatantly ignored him, causing frustration among his teammates, including Anthony, who wasn't happy about Zack's sluggishness. Let's go, Zack. Can't be dragging ass. He needs to snap the hell out of it. Yeah, blatant disregard for teamwork and camaraderie. During the private dinner service, Zack's attempt to assist Ray on plating ended disastrously. Ramsey and Ray noticed Zack's sloppy plate with minimal pasta and no lobster. Hey, Zack, look at that, and look at that. There's no lobster in there, Zack. But you should be leaving this then. Tell it! This frustrated Ray, who rightfully questioned Zack's commitment, leading to a heated exchange. Zack, do me a favor. Fuck off, please. Take it over here. You're killing me. You're killing me. Try to throw me under the bus. During a refire, Ray requested him to finish cooking the lobster in butter. Zack retaliated by sabotaging it cooking it in a cold sauce instead. Earlier, Chef Ray tells me to f off. And now I'm definitely gonna get revenge. I'm trying to sabotage him. Yeah, quite openly at that. Hey, come here, just touch that. It's cold! Ray is cold. This sabotage not only angered Ramsey, who obviously rejected the cold lobster, but also incited Ray's fury towards Zack for undermining the entire team. Later, when leading the New York strip course, Zack seemed really disinterested when John was asking about the sauce. Zack, where's your sauce at? Why can't he talk? He's not answering me, he's completely switched off. Ramsey saw that the stakes weren't being seasoned like the red teams from a mile away. Which sparked a confrontation, with Zack clumsily trying to defend himself and Ramsey accusing him of lying. We seasoned on No, no, you lying f You did not f slice it and season it. <sighs> it's always the seasoning, isn't it? And he really thought he could fool Ramsey. Go ahead and add his name to the list of the hundreds that came before him who've tried and failed. But in short, Zack's betrayal showed a complete lack of respect and teamwork. His actions not only disrupted service, but disrespected the hell out of his teammates, especially Ray. I'm so f pissed at Zack. I'm like, dude, you just you f me. But with all that being said, I really have no idea how this happened. Ray, please give me your jacket, sure. Ray often faces rightful criticism for his performance, but his elimination that night in favor of keeping Zack around was utterly absurd. Ramsey caught Zack red-handed, deliberately trying to sabotage Ray, yet Ray got sent home over him? Gotta say, Ramsey, I do not understand the logic here. Unless you're looking for a deceitful head chef? Moving on, let's look at what happened during season 16's third service. During prep, she refused to communicate and openly stated that she wasn't in the mood to work, which really got under Aziza, Wendy, and Heather's skin. You notice I'm just doing a whole lot of nothing? I've been watching her the whole time. This lack of commitment and effort set a negative tone right from the start. What you working on? I don't know. I'm not in a mood right now. That's very lacy of her, pun intended. During dinner service, Gia's performance at the meat station was marred by inconsistencies and questionable actions. While her first attempt at the lamb was acceptable, her next one was overcooked. It's like feel, it's overcooked. Hello, an absolute meltdown. Her refire attempts were no better, culminating in Ramsey's shock at her Wellingtons being horrendously sliced. I've never ever in the history of Hell's Kitchen been given a Wellington's, not even, not even sliced. Oh, and he wasn't done. It's like some bad from the woods. The most expensive cut anywhere in the world. And look at the way it's dumped. Who gave me this? What followed was a feeble attempt to excuse her blunder by claiming she nearly cut her finger off, prompting Ramsey to call for medical assistance. Sorry, I cut my finger off, Chef. You cut your finger off? Yes. Show me. Should I get the medic? Medic! However, Ramsey's attempt to verify her injury exposed Gia's ruse. Despite her claims of a near finger amputation, there was no visible cut or any blood on her finger at all. Where's the cut? Where's the cut? Right here. Where? It's not there. 
So she wanted an easy way out. The red team lost the service, and during deliberations, this happened. But who's volunteering themselves to go up to them? I'll do it. I'll do it. I Eventually, Jen volunteered, and Gia was nominated. I'm not an arguer. I hate arguing. I lived with that in my family, and I just don't like it. But Jessica's plea for staying in Hell's Kitchen really shed light on her personal struggles. She admitted to nominating herself out of a deep-rooted fear of arguments, a trauma rooted in her past experiences of growing up in a household filled with constant conflict. This revelation hinted at a potential battle with PTSD resulting from her dysfunctional family environment. It seems that her coping mechanism involved avoiding disputes, making her self-nomination a means to dodge future potential conflicts within the team. On the flip side, here's what Gia said. Anytime I'm in the kitchen, I'm working hard, always ready to help one of my teammates. I don't never come in here with an attitude. Hey, you know you were being recorded, right? We saw you stand and give up on your team during prep because, oh, not in the mood. But wait, she had more to add. She's already packed. I'm not packed. I'm ready to stay here. This move to spill dorm secrets to Ramsey didn't earn her any popularity points. She was seen as a rat for not upholding team solidarity. Jessica, you've packed. You are not ready to head to Vegas. Despite Ramsey's earlier stance on dorm issues, meaning he clearly said that he didn't care about what goes on in the dorms, his choice to axe Jessica over Gia's betrayal seemed unjust and went against his own stated policy. I guess what I'm trying to say is that these events brought Ramsey's fairness into question. Jessica's struggles and her coping mechanism should have been considered more empathetically especially since her performance wasn't notably worse than Gia's. I genuinely couldn't grasp what Ramsey saw in Gia. To me, it seemed like one of the most straightforward decisions on the show to eliminate her. However, instead of Gia leaving, Jessica went home instead. Sure, Jessica's mistake in packing was bad, but she only messed up one plate throughout that whole service. Her other services showed improvement, either performing well or bouncing back after a slip-up. On the other hand, Gia lied about her finger injury and completely messed up the meat. I mean, come on, it's night and day. But I'm curious what your take on all of this is. Meanwhile, let me hop over to the next topic. Now, in season nine, following a challenging service, Ramsey tasked the final five chefs with a crucial decision, nominating two individuals for elimination. Elise orchestrated a calculated move. She individually approached both Will and Paul, artfully persuading them to consider Jennifer as the weakest link among the remaining chefs. I have asked you for a favor. When I go up there, I'm going to put Jennifer as the weakest because she is. Typical high school shit. Just say that in front of everyone. Why the backhandedness? She was only looking out for herself by pitting the others against Jennifer like that. I'm being diplomatic and I'm asking you to look out for me because I will look out for you. I know you're better than me. God, how low was she willing to go? But Jennifer was wise to Elise's sly tactics. Confident in her own abilities and considering herself superior to Elise in various aspects, she hoped that Paul and Will would see through Elise's manipulation. After all the she's put us through, Will and Paul are smart enough not to fall for Elise's One can only hope. The deliberation turned into a tense chess game as Ramsey probed the chefs for their nominations. Who is the weakest chef? Come on, man, it's an easy answer. But Paul struggled to make a definitive choice first, prompting Will to abruptly lend his support to Elise as the stronger chef, much to Jennifer's and frankly my disbelief. Solely based on cooking, chef? Uh, Pure I, cooking. I think Elise is a stronger cook than Jennifer. It was tough to watch. Eventually, Paul sided with Elise as being the stronger cook too. Who's the worst cook? Jennifer Chef. You Thank are you. Kidding me? I'm, just, I'm being honest. At least Tommy didn't give in to the pressure and did the right thing by saying that Elise was the weakest link. This sequence of events culminated in the heartbreaking elimination of Jennifer. Despite her undeniable talent and consistent performance throughout the competition, the strategic manipulation orchestrated by Elise, and the wavering decisions of her fellow contestants 
led to Jennifer's unjust departure. I can't believe you two would actually sit here and say that she is better than me. I am. And fans weren't happy. Everyone agreed that Jennifer should have stayed instead. And I mean, hear, here. Will and Paul were manipulated to backstab Jennifer, but it's not like they didn't have any personal motive in this. Jennifer was obviously the better chef and therefore the biggest threat. At least Tommy had integrity and wanted to have an equal fight in the end. All right, I'm getting on my soapbox again. It's a fact that what happened with this contestant just wasn't Shut your fat mouth and listen to me. The potatoes were fair. But that was only one of the times that Ramsay went too far on Hell's Kitchen. Now, before I get into that, let me take a moment to share something actually important. I know, not usually my style, but stick with me here. Chef Kimberly Ryan, the winner of season 16 and single mom of two children, has developed some heart complications after a long battle with COVID-19. She urgently needs heart surgery and has organized a crowdfunding campaign to help cover her medical expenses. So please, take a moment to share this video and the crowdfunding link with as many Hell's Kitchen fans as possible in order to help get the word out. And definitely donate if you're in a position to do so. The GoFundMe link is in the description. As I'm making this video, she's a little under $2,000 from her goal. I know for a fact that we can get her over the line, so let's make it happen. And someone needs to give Gordon Ramsay a heads up too. It's a no-brainer move. He could totally lend a hand, and definitely should. He's got a ton more money than I've got anyway. Anyway, coming back to the video. Many have speculated that Ramsey's softening over the years could be attributed to factors like age, family, or his experiences working with amateur cooks and even kids on shows like MasterChef and MasterChef Junior. However, a more straightforward explanation might be the changing dynamics of television and societal norms. Missy, Missy, come here, you fat mouth little sh about two decades ago, Ramsey could say things that, by today's standards, would not fly on television. Things like calling women cows or b****s or making comments about people being overweight was far more acceptable back then. Times three, Amanda. Nine. Nine. Nowadays, such abusive language for the sake of entertainment or some cheap laughs would certainly face a lot of backlash on social media. And I definitely don't disagree with that being the way things should be. But more pragmatically, getting canceled means huge financial losses for Gordon Ramsay's brand. I guess if societal deterrents aren't working, you could always follow the money. But over the years, the show has a troubling legacy of normalizing some of these forms of abuse. It's not all bad, but when it is bad, it's real bad. And hey, shout out to Tennille for being one of the only contestants who stood their ground and had the guts to question Ramsey's bullying. This shit, but you can't take it. I matter. But not everyone had the nerve to stand up to him. Not even most people. Like in the final six dinner service in season five, Giovanni was at the meat station. However, his habit of constantly opening and closing the convection oven didn't go unnoticed, and Ramsay warned him about potential consequences later on. Every time you open it, add 30 seconds. Yeah, chef. Let's go, huh? And I mean move, yes? When it came time to deliver, Gio's execution of Ben's chicken special was a disaster. A raw drumstick landed on the plate. I had to refire a chicken. I had him in the oven for a long time, but then they start to burn. He admitted to his mistake and requested a minute for a do-over. Despite the setback, Ben remained optimistic, believing that if Gio executed the next time around, he'd salvage the situation. Unfortunately, Gio's second attempt wasn't much better. It was cooked, sure, but he was practically torn to pieces by the time Gio was finished with it. And yeah, Ramsey was far from happy. It's now become not very special. Thanks to the face there. Hurry up, Giovanni. But when Gio pretty reasonably told him to knock it off with the face label, Ramsey only got more furious. But I'm not the face chef. Yeah, say that again. <sighs> Fair enough, I guess. But it escalated to the extent that Ramsey started screaming in Gio's face. If more shitty chicken hit the pass, Gio would be hitting the road. Hey, yeah, you're pissed, are you? I'm not look at me, look at me, eyes! I'm not pissed as I am! In the end, Ramsey reassigned Ben to the meat station to assist Giovanni with his struggling special. Maybe Ben would be able to get his own special right. 
Two hours into the dinner service, Andrea was frustrated that Giovanni had gone all but radio silent. And when he did speak, his stuttering only made it harder for Robert and Andrea to understand it. But I mean, the guy was flustered. And Ramsey was just being unnecessarily aggressive here. The situation got really bad when Robert had to restart, and then restart again. In no small part because of Gio going mute. This prompted Ramsey to gather all three chefs together before putting Gio on blast. It's kind of funny how he yelled, face, this is professional, right in Giovanni's face. I mean, who knew that not wanting to be called a face at work was unprofessional? Face! An emotional person, but he can get my face all he wants. Right? Did anyone else feel like Ramsey totally blew that whole thing out of proportion? I mean, I'm used to him losing it over mediocre food, but when he dropped the face bomb on Geo and he fired back with a simple, I'm not a face chef, I didn't see it as back talk or disrespect. To me, it seemed like Geo was trying to hype himself back up. But I don't know. What's your take? Let me know in the comments. Now, there's this one moment that I felt like the show hit rock bottom. I'm talking about the Hell's Kitchen 3K from season 11. Ramsey picked Mary to lead the race, even though others on her team actually volunteered. Mary, come on down, Mary, let's go. Well, she was honest about being out of shape, but hoped to make up for it somehow. Anyway, the race kicked off, and she was clearly slower, considering she was bringing up the rear. But she finally managed to hit a checkpoint, letting Cindy finally breathe a sigh of relief. But the race was far from over, and she was still pushing herself when the others were already hitting the dining room. By the time she arrived, the service was already in full swing, and Mary was seriously wiped out. She asked for a quick catch-up, considering she found it in her to run the whole course, despite how fit she was. In my opinion, Mary deserved a bit more understanding than she got. Where's Mary? I mean, I don't know what Ramsay was trying to prove by choosing her. It kind of felt like something that the worst, most petty high school gym teacher would try doing. But this situation also reminds me of something that happened in season five. The blue team clinched the scallop cleaning challenge with a narrow 36 to 35 victory, earning them a sweet reward, a helicopter tour of Catalina Island and a submarine ride. Exciting stuff, right? Well, not for Robert. Before the celebration could kick in, Ramsey called him over, delivering a blow that the helicopter insurance wouldn't allow anyone over 300 pounds. With Robert well over 100 pounds over the limit, he had to settle for a ferry ride to the island. Kind of a shame not to soar over the open ocean. And we're all going back, yes, okay. <laughs> you can't help but feel sorry for him. But I mean, what's a ferry ride in the grand scheme of things? If it means the real part of the reward was still waiting for him. Unfortunately, by the time he finally reached the island, the reward was already done and dusted. This left him with just a complimentary round trip ferry ride while his teammates enjoyed the full experience. I mean, sure, the dude was heavy, but that doesn't diminish his worth as a person. Could they not arrange for another helicopter or something? Or, you know, wait for him? It honestly felt more like a punishment than a reward, and believe me, no one enjoys seeing someone get screwed out of a reward. Now, let's talk about what happened in Season 8, Episode 6, when the Salad Challenge winner Rob scored a chance to grace the cover of Bon Appetit magazine alongside Ramsey. Now, this is where things get a bit sour. The guest judge, not Ramsey, picked Rob as the victor. But at the photo shoot, it was crystal clear that Ramsey wasn't thrilled about sharing the limelight with Rob. For the sofa. <laughs> A lot of fat ones, too. To make things worse, he tossed a series of weight-related insults Rob's way. Make Rob look like 95 pounds. <laughs> Man, what is it with this guy in weight? I know he takes fitness seriously, but cut everyone else some slack. I love working out, but I don't belittle people that don't. The Chosen magazine cover had Ramsey and the Bon Appetit lady front and center, while poor Rob was hidden behind a chair. But wait isn't the only issue. Ramsey can come across as harsh, especially towards shorter chefs as well. And I'm not gonna get through a video like this without coming to defend my short kings. Eddie from season three got a pretty brutal send off with a 
took off from Ramsay, which felt unnecessarily cruel. Even the worst chefs usually get a bit of respect on their way out. Yes, chef. And then there's Craig from season four, the guy with the giant chef's hat. Ramsay was constantly on his ass too. Small boy syndrome downstairs. Okay. Absolutely unnecessary. You come down to my kitchen again with a ridiculous hat on like that. I mean, can we just be a little more empathetic towards people's insecurities and not make fun of them? Especially when you're putting them on blast for the world to see? Eddie, being five foot two due to being born without kidneys, already had a tough situation. And the constant teasing about his height just sucks to see. Eddie is a small guy and I'm not sure when he can come out of that ship. Eddie didn't choose to be born the way he was and using it as a weapon against him just doesn't and sit right with me. At least, maybe focus more on his cooking skills? Like how he does with literally everyone else? Moving on. Every time Ramsey slams food on someone's body, yeah, it pisses me off. And this happened on the very first episode of the show. Talk about setting the tone. After Ralph and Jeff handled their initial tables, Ralph submitted his first order to Ramsey. However, only Michael responded to Ramsey's call, and the rest of the team just sort of awkwardly stood around. That was absolutely pathetic. I call out the first ticket, the big excitement. Meanwhile, Jeff found himself in a bit of a pickle, unsure whether he should hand his ticket to Jean-Philippe or Ramsey. Jean-Philippe clarified that it should go directly to Ramsey. And leave Come the ticket on, on top. Yeah. No, you need to give it hand okay, by hand. Give me the fucking ticket. Over in the red kitchen, Elsie was eager to earn Ramsey's approval. But her aspirations took a hit when her risotto turned out overcooked. So much so that it was practically glued to the plate. Ramsey theatrically waved the dish around. And not a single grain budged. So into the trash it went. What is that? I can't, come on, f***ing hell. I'm down. And Elsie looked nervously around before quietly starting over. One hour into the service, not a single dish had left the kitchen. Ralph's table was getting restless, and he was trying his best to figure out how long it would take to get food over there. Over in the blue kitchen, Michael ran out of lobster spaghetti, but Ramsey brushed off the issue stating that as long as they had live lobsters and pasta, there was no reason to remove it from the menu. Michael promptly rushed to the back store to go grab the ingredients. So why do we have to take it off? We don't, chef. Yeah, that's a sign of a lazy restaurant. When Ralph's table finally made their way up to the kitchen to express their frustration with the wait, Ramsey's response was far from accommodating. He bluntly told them to shut up and instructed the blue team to ignore the situation referring to the guests as... Can we just get them all up top now? Let's go. Just ignore these bimbos. I think Ramsey gets away with a lot of stuff simply because he's Gordon Ramsay. Like, calling your guests bimbos? If it were me, I'd definitely walk out right then and there. But the ladies found it within themselves to go back to their table. An hour and 20 minutes into the service, some of the red diners were already digging into their appetizers and moving on to entrees. However, things took a nosedive when Chris sent up an overcooked salmon. And so Ramsey did the obvious thing, smacked the fish against Chris's chest, scolding him for sending it when he knew it was messed up, and ordering him to redo the entire table. It's a, it's a little fucked up, so. Don't do, do it again, okay? Yeah, if you didn't get my sarcasm, one of those things was not like the others. Chris, seemingly unfazed, believed Ramsey would come around eventually. Meanwhile, Jimmy took a more confrontational route, calling Ramsey insane and vowing not to let the chef treat him like garbage. That's insane. I'm not about to take shit from Gordon. Uh, I'm not a piece of garbage. Uh, fair enough, I guess. However, when Jimmy sent up a dish of his own, Ramsey did the exact same thing he did with Chris. Then you want to walk away winning a restaurant? Oh, fuck yourself. Get in the bin. I mean, it was bad for sure, but do we really need to start throwing things? <sighs> anyway, two hours into the dinner service, things were going way worse than Ramsey had expected. Both teams were struggling to get appetizers out, and the entrees were quickly becoming a pie-in-the-sky dream. 
In the midst of it all, Andrew decided to provoke Ramsay by asking if the dessert he made was acceptable. Ramsay didn't hold back. Facing Andrew and making it clear he wasn't about to leave the hot plate to check on a dessert of all things. He told Andrew that if he had questions, he needed to come down to the hot plate himself. And Andrew boldly challenged Ramsay to pick on him. I'm trying to run the hot plate here, so would you be so kind to come and talk to me? Is that clear? Over in the red kitchen, Elsie made a comeback by sending a second risotto to redeem herself successfully catching Ramsay's attention and sensing he acknowledged her determination. On the other hand, Jimmy's meat station was practically in ruins, but he hoped to follow Elsie's lead in spite of it. However, he was so flustered that he grabbed some lamb from the oven with his bare hands, which obviously sent him straight to the medic. I uh, had to go get a lamb instead of grabbing tongue. And trust me, Ramsey was intent on kicking everyone while they were down. Jimmy weighs 250 pounds. He's never going to make a great chef because he's too clumsy. Later, Elsie noticed Carillon seemingly doing nothing but watching. Ramsey also took notice and called Carillon over to assist, but this didn't sit well with her. I wish I were superwoman, knew everybody's stations. Chef Ramsey just really made me angry. When Jimmy returned from the medic, Ramsey, you guessed it, showed zero sympathy whatsoever. Screw up so many bits of meat in one service. Meanwhile, Jeff attempted to make it up to his tables for the wait. But Ramsey shut him down when he went to the hot plate to submit another order. Then, Ramsey's eponymous bimbos attempted to return to the kitchen. But Ramsey shut them down even harder this time. Jean Philippe Souffle, can you escort these two ladies, please? Back to plastic surgery. Ladies, please. Oh boy, here we go. Well, as both kitchens finally received approval to send out entrees, customers fed up with the way walked out. And with no customers, there wasn't much of a point to keeping the kitchen open. As the blue team cleaned up, Ralph called the night what it was. Ugly for both sides. Meanwhile, Andrew felt that he had given his all that night. What a way to kick off an entirely new show, huh? Even back then, nobody could agree on anything. <laughs> anyway, moving on, if you remember, Vinny was holding down the garnish station in his third service in season three, but it wasn't long before he royally screwed up the scallops. But instead of addressing the issue professionally, or even loud but constructive, Ramsey's specialty, he took an unorthodox approach. He picked up a stray raw egg and decided to smash it on Vinny's chest. What, what is that? What is that? Not really, yeah. I've gotta say, I've got zero justification for Ramsay's behavior there. I mean, as if smearing cooked food all over Chef's chest wasn't enough, raw stuff? Like, come on. And by the way, Ramsay also unnecessarily kicked out a chef who didn't deserve to be kicked out in the first place. I'm talking about season 11, episode nine. Yeah, if you know, you know. But if not, let me get you up to speed. As the first customers entered, Cindy was trying her best to play nice with Susan. Meanwhile, Nedra sent out her appetizers, but Mary forgot to drop the slider. I've called out the slider already. Why is it not on? I didn't hear you, Chef. I'm sorry, Chef. Ramsay questioned Mary about it, but she didn't hear him initially. Despite Mary's assurance to fix it, Ramsay wasn't pleased. So, the women had to restart the ticket. Eventually, Nedra and Mary managed to send their dishes to the pass, all of which were accepted. However, they also unknowingly sent up some hair with a customer's slider. Captain, I'm sorry. There's a hair in between a burger. Yeah, things were about to get ugly, especially when Jean-Philippe brought it to Ramsay's attention. God almighty, fucking hair! Refire urgently. Mary was determined to salvage her reputation after the hair incident, and fortunately, Ramsey accepted her next slider, sans hair, crisis averted. As they transitioned to entrees, Susan took charge, presenting her prime rib that she had just taken out of the convection oven. As Susan went to the dining room to serve it, Jacqueline and Amanda were idle at the meat station, waiting for Susan to finish slicing. When Jacqueline informed Ramsey that they were waiting for Susan, he called the entire team down. Susan thought she might be praised for Jacqueline's skills. However, Ramsey had something else in mind. Hold on. We're waiting for Susan. No, you f you. Do 
you notice what's wrong here again? Over an hour into service, the women faced Ramsey's wrath for halting progress on their entrees before reorganizing themselves. Entrees? Did you tell her to stop? No. Oh, really? Susan, returning to the dining room, shared what was going on with a customer. Maybe not the best move, but Jacqueline eventually followed up with perfect steak dishes, so... However, chaos ensued when Mary announced her sea bass was ready. But Amanda still needed four minutes. Frustrated, Mary escalated the issue to Ramsey, saying she had warned them ahead of time. But Amanda completely refuted that. I told them! Please. Did she tell you that? No, chef! And when Jacqueline sent her filet mignon, it turned out raw. Ramsey got on both Jacqueline and Amanda's cases for botching the easiest cut of meat. Raw filet, the easiest to cook, cold and raw. Amanda regretted trusting Jacqueline, and Jacqueline vowed never to trust anyone ever again. This is when Nedra stepped in to help the two of them. So let's hope they figure out how to trust Nedra. As Ramsey called for another filet mignon, Amanda claimed to be checking on it, giving one minute to Nedra. But apparently, it was one minute too few. Or, well, five. I have two more in the oven. So it seems pretty fair that the three were kicked out of the kitchen. But they brought an unwilling stowaway with them. You, 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 fuck off, all four of you. Get out! Yeah. Cindy, and boy was she mad about it. You're kicking me out because Jacqueline and Amanda can't cook a freaking filet? And I'm completely with her on this one. She was done dirty. Like, rewind to the start of this section. Guess how many times I've talked about her so far. Yup, that was literally the only time I mentioned her. She also had a small cameo earlier in the video. Let me know if you managed to find it. Anyway, Amanda and Jacqueline were the ones who were really behind those raw steaks. And Ramsey came in from the top rope and completely bodied Cindy out of nowhere. Totally unfair. But what do you think? Go ahead and let me know in the comments. I know I miss stuff sometimes, but I really don't think I missed anything with Cindy this time around. But please, keep me honest. And if you enjoy my videos, don't forget to check out my social media pages to keep up with me. And show your support by leaving a like, subscribing, and turning on my post notifications so you don't miss a thing. Also, make sure to check out the next video right here. It's even better.